It is midnight in Washington, 5 in London, and 2 on a Monday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gan Young. Let's get a check of the main stories we're following at this hour. Universal welfare and gradual unification of the two Koreas are what Democratic Party leader Kim An Gil emphasized during his first press conference of the new year. The ruling party will hold its New Year's press conference on Tuesday. Two of Korea's biggest conglomerates in market capitalization and sales account for nearly a third of the total operating income of local firms in 2012. They are Samsung and Hyundai Motor. And Pope Francis names his first batch of cardinals, choosing 19 men from Asia, Africa, and elsewhere, including the Archbishop of Seoul. Archbishop Andrew Young Soo Jung will become the third ever Korean to be appointed a cardinal, following Stephen Kim Soo Hun and Nicholas Chung Jin Seok. We'll have those stories and more, but first, at kicking off the annual New Year's press conference by leaders of the nation's main political parties, the chief of the main opposition Democratic Party took aim at President Park Geun-hye earlier this Monday in his first press conference of the new year. Now, in his remarks, he also stressed universal welfare and a gradual reunification with North Korea. The ruling Senate Party is scheduled to hold a presser on Tuesday. Arirang News Kim Hyun Ji starts us off. Democratic Party Chief Kim An Gil criticized President Park's New Year's speech, saying she failed to provide concrete details on how she intends to improve the livelihoods of ordinary people in a country with the world's high suicide rate among the young and senior citizens. The president did not mention economic democratization or welfare even once during her New Year's speech. It's shocking. Kim said his party will promote welfare support aimed at helping people live a dignified life. My party will strengthen policy for education, housing and health care to stop the collapse of the middle class and restore the ladder of hope that enables the poor to move into the upper class. Specifically, the Democratic Party chief said his party will push for free school meals, free high school education, and cutting the cost of college tuition in half. He added that he and his party will work toward putting a cap on rental prices, including jeonse, which requires that a large lump sum deposit be paid up front and is returned in full at the end of the rental period. Kim also called for a strengthening of public health care policy and an expansion of public medical facilities for patients with severe diseases and dementia. He stressed that the party will oppose any attempt by the government to privatize health care or railway services. He also said he welcomed President Park's concept of reunification as a jackpot for the two Koreas, but stressed that the government must be sure to take practical steps to improve inter-Korean relations and prepare for a gradual and peaceful reunification with North Korea. Targeting the local elections in June, the Democratic Party leader vowed to overcome the factionalism within his party and respond quickly to the public's demands. To break a long-standing deadlock in Parliament, he pledged to push for an independent investigation into the alleged illegal electioneering by state institutions in 2012. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. A powerful doctors' association has warned it is ready to go on general strike in March to protest government policies to introduce for-profit hospitals and telemedicine services. Park Ji-won tells us more. The Korean Medical Association, which boasts some 90,000 doctors, as its members says, it will go on general strike starting March 3rd unless the government changes plans to establish for-profit hospitals and telemedicine services. The association opposes the government's drive towards telemedicine and for-profit hospitals and demands a fundamental reform of the nation's health insurance system. However, the doctor's association is open to dialogue. Depending on the negotiations with the government, the strike could be delayed, according to an emergency planning committee. The health ministry has also shown a willingness to start talks with the association. The government respects the medical association's decision to defer the general strike and engage in dialogue through a consultative group. The government will enter talks with an open mind. The situation was sparked when the government put ads in newspapers last week promoting the advantages of telemedicine services and for-profit hospitals. 
The medical association is strongly opposed to both, saying they will impair the quality of medical services for citizens. In its statement, the Doctors Association said the telemedicine program has never been fully tested in Korea and it is not yet a reliable way to make a diagnosis. The Medical Association also said the government is misleading citizens, disguising the establishment of for-profit hospitals as if it is an investment measure for mid-sized hospitals when it is actually aiming to establish for-profit hospitals. In response, the health ministry said the teleconsultations are mostly aimed at low-risk patients and those who live in remote areas where visiting doctors is not easy. The government also said the for-profit hospitals will be allowed to run additional projects like attracting patients from other countries which will not affect the public nature of the medical service in Korea. The government has been pushing for the establishment of both along with other deregulating measures as a means to expand the nation's medical industry. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, Korea state-owned firms will be forced to downsize the welfare benefits given to their employees as the government pushes to tackle what it considers reckless management of public enterprises. In a new set of government guidelines, the so-called progressive retirement annuity system, which pays a larger pension the longer a person works for a company, is to be ended. Now, the same goes for child care and college tuition support. The state-run firms will also be banned from giving interest-free mortgages to their employees. In response to a public backlash against public entities mounting debt and lax management, the government has pledged to clamp down on these organizations to see their debts reduced. It seems the Korean economy is becoming even more dependent on its two biggest conglomerates, Samsung and Hyundai Motor. The combined operating profit of the two conglomerates accounted for more than 30 percent of the combined operating profit of all Korean companies for the first time in 2012. And this is according to market research site Chebol.com. Samsung accounted for about 21 percent of local companies' combined operating profit and Hyundai Motor about 9 percent. That's a combined increase of about 6 percent compared to the previous year. Experts have raised the concern that the country's heavy reliance on the two conglomerates could more easily trigger financial instability when the country is hit by a crisis. Now we kick off our five-part series on Korea's industrial competitiveness with parts and materials. The sector, which used to depend heavily on imports, is now leading the nation's exports thanks to active corporate investment and government support. Our Hwang Ji-hae looks at the sector's prospects and the challenges that remain. This Korean semiconductor packaging company has recently found a way to make the world's thinnest chip. Normally, companies produce one millimeter thick semiconductors, but we're able to produce them with a thickness of half of that. We are ahead of every other company. Until around 10 years ago, Korean companies hardly reported any breakthrough in the manufacturing of parts and materials, but it's a different story these days. Now Korea is the world's fifth largest parts and materials exporting nation closely following Japan. And with the domestic parts and materials sectors getting a boost recently, the trade surplus last year reached a record high of nearly $100 billion. That is nearly 40 times larger than the sector's trade surplus recorded in 2001. Exports of parts and materials currently take up almost half of the nation's overall exports. Experts say the improving competitive edge of Korea's finished goods are also helping the parts and materials sectors. The rise in exports of products like television, mobile phones, automobiles and machinery have pushed up demand for key components of those goods. The Seoul government is determined to make Korea the world's fourth largest exporter of parts and materials by 2020, surpassing Japan and more than doubling the sector's trade surplus to $250 billion. While the nation has made a leap forward in manufacturing parts, it still lags behind in developing new materials. The problem is Korea is far behind Japan in the area of new materials, while China is catching up fast in making parts. 
To narrow the gap with Japan, the government has promised to pour $280 million into the local industry every year until 2025. Huang Jie, Arirang News. Well, it's becoming harder for young people to find a stable job, and recent figures tell the tale. Last year, over 20 percent of young people aged 15 to 29 were hired as temporary workers for their first job. Now, this is according to Statistics Korea Monday. That's double the percentage of young people hired as temporary workers back in 2008. Now, over the same five-year period from 2008 to 2013, the number of young people in the same age group who found stable long-term jobs dropped by half to 128,000. Now, experts say the problem is a lack of high-quality jobs, which is in turn a result of the effects of the global financial crisis. This is, of course, disheartening news for young job seekers who were already struggling with a low employment rate of 40 percent as of last month, which put Korea 29th out of 34 OECD countries in terms of youth employment. And now taking a brief look at how the local stock market is doing at this hour. Seoul shares rose in early trading on this Monday as a surprisingly weak U.S. jobs report revived speculation the Federal Reserve would retain its loose monetary policy for longer, bolstering risk appetite. As of 1.30 p.m. Korea time, the benchmark Kospi was up 0.7 percent after touching an intraday high of 1954. It is now trading at 1952. The Kospi has failed to close out a positive session since January 7th. The tech heavy Kazdaq was also trading up six tenths of a percent, while on the foreign exchange counter, the Korean currency was trading stronger against the greenback at roughly or exactly 1,056 won flat. All of the day's important events, events close to home, around the world. The second half last figure out what orders. The arts and culture scene and the heart of global business. Arirang News has your whole day covered. The legislature will convene a plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government. Archbishop Andrew Yomsujang will become the third ever Korean to be appointed a cardinal following Stephen Kim Soo-hwan and Nicholas Chung jin Seok. So why was Yom chosen? Well, our Kwon Soo-wa has more on his background. More than half of his life, Archbishop Yom Soo Jung has devoted himself to religion. He is not only currently the de facto leader of the Korean Catholic Church, but was appointed a cardinal by Pope Francis on Sunday at St. Peter's Square in the Vatican. Yom was born into and raised by a highly religious family. Three out of six children, including the to-be cardinal himself, became priests. He graduated from the Catholic University of Korea in 1970, was ordained as a priest in the same year, and was appointed as the 14th Catholic Archbishop of Seoul by Pope Benedict XVI in 2012. Yom also serves as chairman of the Catholic television channel Peace Broadcasting Corporation and continues the Pabo Nanum or Fools Sharing Foundation of late Cardinal Stephen Kim Soo-hwan. Religious leaders in Korea welcomed the Pope's choice and expressed hope Korea's church will contribute to the Asian as well as the global Catholic community. Eighteen others will join Yom as a cardinal too. They come from 15 different locations, including Italy, Germany, Britain, Brazil and the Philippines. The decision on archbishops from Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso and Haiti, which marked its fourth anniversary of a deadly earthquake, reflect Pope Francis' commitment to the poor. Meanwhile, 16 out of the 19 are under 80 years, making them eligible to vote for the next pope. Andrew Yom Sujong is 70 years old. He will be officially appointed as a cardinal on February 22nd. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And now shifting our focus, wrapping up months of negotiations, Korea and the U.S. have finally agreed to a new cost-sharing agreement for the stationing of U.S. troops in Korea. Arirang News' Shin Se-min reports. South Korea says it'll pay 866 million U.S. dollars to the United States this year to keep American troops on the Korean peninsula. The foreign ministry says the allies struck a deal Saturday to share the cost of stationing 28,500 U.S. troops in the south. 
The outcome ensures a stable condition for U.S. troops stationed in Korea and is a fair sum to be paid by the Korean government. We reached what we think is a figure that is acceptable to the National Assembly and the people. The two sides settled for a 5.8 percent increase, which is up $47 million from last year's special measures agreement. The increased rate has worried some who say the defense costs may exceed one trillion won or $940 million by 2017. Under the deal effective through 2018, the annual rate of increase in Seoul's share will be tallied with the application of the Consumer Price Index, but will not exceed more than 4 percent. Washington has also agreed to enhance transparency in how it uses Seoul's money. It will send reports to the Korean government detailing where the money is being spent. The new contract will also improve the welfare and well-being of Koreans working for the U.S. military in Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry says the new deal was a good deal for the country as Washington had been pushing for nearly $895 million. While the ruling Kennedy party welcomes the outcome, the main opposition Democratic Party is not impressed. It says a deal was poorly executed and assigned a deal might not face an easy ride in parliament where it still needs to be approved. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Amid the backdrop of tension and uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula, South Korea's military has been placing extra emphasis on being combat ready to face any threat from North Korea. Well, Arirang News Kim Hyun bin reports on winter training exercises underway on the outskirts of Korea's Olympic town of Pyeongchang. It goes without saying that maintaining a staunch defense against possible North Korean provocations is one of the Park Geun-hye administration's key goals this year and the remaining years of her term thereafter. And the president has made it clear that strengthening national security is very high on her agenda. To ensure readiness, the Defense Ministry initiated a winter exercise last week in Pyeongchang-kun, Gangwon-do province, a place well known for its brutally cold winters, where temperatures regularly plunge below minus 20 degrees Celsius. Scores of Special Forces cadets are busy training, despite the bone-chillingly cold temperatures. It's a clear display of South Korea's military might and readiness to fight off any attack from the north. But it's just another day for South Korea's special forces. Whether it's blistering hot or numbingly cold, these men are ready to fight and successfully carry out their missions. To successfully conduct our missions in extreme conditions, we are enhancing our combat capabilities through realistic training. They showed off numerous maneuvers, with cadets skiing down slopes, sniping down potential enemies, while reaching their targets undetected. These types of training exercises are held throughout the nation periodically. They serve two purposes, ensuring complete military readiness to potential threats and giving the public the peace of mind that the military can keep them safe from an unpredictable northern neighbor. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News, Pyeongchang. An interim nuclear deal between Iran and six world powers will start on January 20th. Under the terms of the agreement, which was reached in November, Iran will see some sanctions suspended as soon as the deal takes effect. Tehran has agreed to halt enrichment of uranium above 5 percent purity and neutralize its stockpile of near 20 percent enriched uranium. The deal gives world powers in Tehran six months to agree on a complete end to a standoff that has raised the risk of a wider Middle East war. U.S. President Barack Obama welcomed the news, but U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry cautioned that the next stage in negotiations would be very difficult. The EU's foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton said said the world powers will ask the International Atomic Energy Agency to verify the deal's implementation. As soon as possible. Over in Thailand, anti-government protesters there are gathering to try to shut down the capital and overthrow Prime Minister Ng Lak Chinawat. The protesters say they want to shut down Bangkok, end parliamentary rule and abort February elections, which Chinawat's ruling party is almost certain to win. 
They say the current leader is only a proxy to her brother and exiled former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who was ousted by the military in 2006. The government has beefed up security, stationing some 15,000 police and military personnel in and around the capital. At least seven were injured on Saturday when unknown gunmen opened fire on anti-government protesters at a rally site in the capital. And now it's time for our first arts and culture segment of the week with our Ite Ho. Um, he is in the studio with us, and today he will be giving us an update on the latest news from the arts and culture scene. Good afternoon to you, Ite Ho. Good afternoon. So what do you have in store for us today? Well, for all of you who like to plan ahead, I have a lineup of international musicians who will be performing here in Seoul this month and the next. English singer-songwriter James Blake will be in town for his first concert in Seoul. Blake's music is a combination of classical, R&B and electronica that produces a rich and diverse dubstep sound. He is being called a genius of the genre by those in the music industry, and we here in Seoul will be able to experience his genius on January 19th at the Uniqlo Axe Hall in Gwangjinggu, Seoul. Rock and roll princess Avril Lavigne is also set to perform here in Seoul as part of her tour promoting her latest self-titled album. The singer's music has grown and matured throughout the 13-year career, but the trademark honesty of her lyrics remains unchanged. Check it out on February 19th at Olympic Hall in Olympic Park, which is located in Songpago, Seoul. With record sales of over 26 million, the pop era group Il Devo is set to kick off their 2014 global tour right here in Seoul. The set list includes songs made famous by popular musicals such as Bring Him Home from Les Miserables and The Music of the Night from The Phantom of the Opera. Il Devo will be in Seoul for their concert, A Musical Affair, on February 22nd at the Chamsil Indoor Stadium in Songpagu, Seoul. Well, it seems like the concert scene here in Korea will be kicking off the new year with uh, big namers from all around the globe. That's right, and the big names don't stop there. The really, really popular musician Bruno Mars is also set to perform here in Seoul later this year. And I'll be bringing everybody up to date on the details as we approach the concert date. Excellent. Uh, we'll all be looking forward to that. Now, Teo, um, you, have, you also have news about a very popular Korean film, in addition to one that you talked about last week, opening in the U.S. That's right. Now, the film is currently running right here in Seoul, all across theaters in the nation, but now producers have their sights set on the North American market as well. Just a few days shy of the one-month anniversary of its premiere, the film The Attorney has already eclipsed the 9 million viewer mark here in Korea and is set to hit the all-important blockbuster viewership number of 10 million later this week. This is familiar territory for lead actor Song kang ho who last year had two films hit the 9 million mark but just weren't able to achieve the double-digit status. But with the film still going strong at theaters nationwide, the 10 million mark should come easy this time around. Meanwhile, the film's popularity here in Korea has caught the attention of the North American market as well. Entertainment distribution company Wellgo USA has acquired the distribution rights to the film, and it is set to open on February 7th in 14 major cities across North America, including LA and New York in the United States and Vancouver in Canada. You know, very impressive figures, and it seems like whether uh, they really hit it well here in, at home or not, you know, they are really, the Korean movies are really attracting the uh, taste buds of the distribution companies all over the world. Well, American companies always seem to look for new content, and with the continued popularity of Korean films here at home and abroad, I think uh, hopefully this will be a catalyst to see more Korean films opening abroad in more and more theaters. Right, and we will uh, keep our fingers crossed. Thank you, Teo, for that, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. All right. Well, it is one dry and crispy day here in Seoul, but here now is a look at the weather conditions in your neck of the woods.
And that's all from me at this hour. Thank you for staying here with us. I'll be back with more of the day's latest at 4 p.m. Korea time.